Okay, folks, I'm going to try a different um, piece of software with this um, lecture uh, talking into my iPad so you don't have to put up with a picture of me in the corner. So let's see how it works. Tell me if you like it or not. We'll see. So I'm going to walk you through um, my version of the part of the book I asked you to read for Tuesday. So pages 73 to 91 from our textbook. Now this is all titled under the first law of thermodynamics. When we say thermodynamics, it's the study of heat and temperature, especially the laws that govern the conversion into other forms of energy. So it's not strictly a study that just involves chemistry. Um, you certainly are interested in this if you're doing physics or engine mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, things like that. But in chemistry, it allows us to predict if a reaction will proceed or if reactions will proceed and what the maximum yield might be. It doesn't require quantum mechanics, however, so that's an advantage, but it has no comment on how fast the reactions can go. We already did that in kinetics. It is a distinct negative. So we're going to be talking about the transfer again of heat into other forms of energy. Principally, we care about work. Let me remind you something you've already seen. Mechanical work is force times distance, the physicists tell us, newtons times meters, and that force is mass times acceleration. But other kinds of work exist. Surface work, that involves surface tension times a change in area. Electrical work is a potential difference times a charge transfer. Gravitational work, which is mass times acceleration times the change in the height, the difference in height. And expansion work, which is pressure, the um, external pressure times a change in volume. Let's take a look at a um, physical example to try to explore if we get anything interesting out of um, these equations that you've been presented. So imagine you have a compressed gas that I'm trying to illustrate here with the um, darkness of my little sketch and removing those pins that are keeping the piston down so that the gas is compressed and allowing the gas to expand against the mass that's riding on top of that, um, of that piston, let's call it. Um, now, expanding only against that mass, we're not bringing in, for now, external pressure. We're going to say the work that's done by the compressed gas is equal to this product of the mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the difference in the height level. So how far um, the piston has gone up. Now why is there a negative sign there? The negative sign arises because of the convention that the system is losing energy. And so you can see that you have to make a choice um, in a system to describe it as your point of view um, or the outside as the point of view. And I think it makes sense to us that the system, for us in this case, is the compressed gas. If that system is pushing against the, um, the mass, then it's losing some of its internal energy. Um, an alternative way to write what I just wrote is more like the version um, that I have above. Now, remember, we've discussed deltas and d's before. d is the value that's implied with an infinitesimal change. Ultimately, we re remember from calculus that's going to allow us to do integrals. So... If we recall that um, pressure is a uh, force over area, we can make a substitution here so that we could express the work that's done using an expression that is based on pressure. And um, you can see again, since pressure is defined as um, force over area, um, rewriting it as uh, P times the area um, substitutes for the mg term that was in the earlier uh, term. So area times the change in the height now is going to give us a volume. So what we've just derived um, is an expression that sort of equates um, expansion work and gravitational work. It's just a matter of 
the, your point of view. It really should be the same amount of energy that's given off by the system. Um, now, depending on what the conditions are of this little exercise, um, the amount of work can vary considerably. If the, if the weight is a very weak, a uh, very small weight, then the um, system's not going to do as much work as if it was a heavy weight, assuming you're, it's expanding over the same distance. Um, one extreme is expanding against a vacuum. And I always challenge myself on how to spell the word vacuum. It's one of those words that I always have trouble with. Um, notice that if I were to remove those um, pins and there was literally nothing above the piston, no work would be done because there's nothing to push against, which is kind of an absurd extreme, but it does follow from the equations that that's what you see. So... More commonly, there's a constant external pressure. As long as the pressure on the inside is greater than the external pressure or the applied pressure, the gas will expand until the two pressures are equal to each other. So if your compressed gas is pressing against a constant external pressure, the work that it does is represented by the equation that we already showed you. But here's the thing that we talked about at the very beginning how thermodynamics allows us to, to explore different possibilities. Can we extract more work out of the compressed gas by somehow changing the conditions? The answer is we can. So I've drawn a little sketch here. Imagine a piston setup with an incredibly large number of identical very tiny weights exerting a total pressure on the piston. So for us here, the internal pressure is equal to the external pressure at equilibrium. But now, what if you remove one weight? For a very brief moment, the internal pressure is going to be larger than the external pressure in this case. And the gas will slightly expand until then uh, the internal pressure will be equal to the external pressure. Now, take a second weight removed. And then, if you do that, remove a second weight, the internal pressure is going to be a little bit greater than the external pressure, and it will expand again until the internal pressure is equal to the external pressure. Um, at each stage, the equation that we mentioned above is true. That is, the work that's done is going to be equal to minus the external pressure times the change in the volume. Now, what about when dV is infinitesimally small? Infinitesimally Lots of words that Dr. Check has trouble spelling. When dV is infinitesimally small, this will allow us to use an integral because we're going to have an, essentially an infinite number of steps. This will allow us, whoops, us to use an integral because of so many steps. In other words, the total work for all those steps is going to be the external pressure each step times this. Okay? Now, how do we deal with the fact that this pressure is constantly changing? Well, we're going to make a substitution. So, let me go to red to highlight this. So, um, first off, um, remember again, this is very important to state that this difference between the external and the internal in the, in the moment that the change occurs, again, it's a tiny, tiny difference that's allowed to change. Um, and so, this is going to allow uh, me to write a slightly different version of the equation 
that I hope we'll, you'll see will make it solvable. Because right now it's not solvable because you got too many variables changing. Well, one thing is, is that this is the product of two infinitesimal numbers. So that's going to go away. It's not going to matter much. Two infinitesimal numbers. And then I'm going to have this expression. Well, I still have the problem I mentioned in that the pressure is constantly changing. How can I make a substitution that will allow me to have a solvable integral? Well, I'm going to use the ideal gas law. Now, again, assuming that the ideal gas law is operable here, we don't have extreme conditions. I have a new version that's going to make my uh, integral solvable. So I have minus nRT over V times dV. Um, I could slide through the moles, the R and the T, and essentially take the integral of dV over V. Whoops, I forgot my, forgot my constants, and I ran out of room on this slide. I'll jump over to the next one. Okay, so now that I have enough space, um, I've made the ideal gas law substitution for the internal pressure over the course of the expansion. Um, this allows us to solve the integral because um, what I have, I should have in an intermediate state here, I'm taking the integral of dV over V, which is the natural log of um, V2 over V1, the limits of the integral. Um, you could also express the um, value of the work that's done in terms of the pressures by making another ideal gas law um, substitution. Now, in fact, this ends up being the maximum amount of work that can be extracted from the system. By doing these infinitesimal steps. This is actually called a reversible expansion. Um, it's a type of expansion, as we said, in which the steps are so small, they're essentially infinitesimally close to an equilibrium. So the smallest amount of pressure the opposite direction as its expansion will put it back to the original. That's kind of the idea behind calling it reversible. We use reversible in different ways in chemistry. This way is a bit of a stretch, I've always thought, but it's the way of doing a process with infinitesimally small steps. That's the synonym that you should be thinking of. Now, it's not the same definition as in kinetics, where you have something that is let's say, simultaneously proceeding in each direction. Um, that's, that's not what reversible means here. Now, even though this um, example is something we're going to, or really term we're going to be using again and again, um, it would take an infinite amount of time because, again, think about it. If you're doing infinitesimally small expansions, then you don't have enough time to do that large a number. But it's good to know this value because it will allow us to calculate efficiency. So um, heat is a different type of a transfer of energy. In this case, it's the transfer of energy between two objects that are at different temperatures. Um, the quantitative amount is defined by a process. Um, it's path dependent. I'm going to talk a little bit about more of that in a minute. But I don't want you to think of heat as a property of a system. Um, for example, if I have a beaker of water that I have a 20 degrees Celsius and I want to convert it to 30 degrees Celsius, um, we talk about putting energy into the system in a variety of ways. You could use a Bunsen burner or some other way um, using a type of equation that maybe you remember from um, your uh, Gen Chem world uh, time. Um, 
in which we had like MC delta T. I notice our book uses S for specific heat, um, specific heat capacity, I should call it, on a per gram basis, and then the change in temperature. But that's not the only way I could raise the temperature of the water. I could basically use mechanical energy. I could stir it so fast that friction um, between my stirring rod and the um, glass beaker causes energy transfer into the water to heat up the water mechanically. Um, I could do a mixture of the two. I, all I'm trying to get across is that transfers of energy are dependent on exactly how you do it, the quantitative value. And so for that, um, that's why we use lowercase letters for heat. We use the letter Q. We use the lowercase w for work. Both of these quantities are dependent on the path. Um, they are not functions of the state. Remember how earlier how I said heat is not a property of the system? Um, you could say that a system has internal energy, but you don't say that it contains heat or it contains work. Um, now, we're familiar with joules. That's the SI unit for um, amounts of energy. They can be used for heat or work. Um, kind of an English unit calorie isn't used so much in um, chemistry, but it does exist. Um, remember that the food calorie is not the same. So I'll use a capital C to remind you that one food calorie is a thousand of these little C calories. Now let's do a couple of examples. So this is an example straight out of our book. If you take uh, 0 0.850 moles of an ideal gas, initially at 15 atmospheres and 300 K. So we're going to follow the conditions of the equations we derived earlier about work. And you're going to allow this compressed gas to expand isothermally. So again, following those conditions in which we're allowed to substitute um, uh, the values using the ideal gas law, assuming that temperature is constant. And you're going to allow the gas to expand until the final pressure is 1 atmospheres. What are the different amounts of work that are done? Well, in the beginning, you could just imagine pulling the pins out, allowing it to expand and then putting pins back in when it attains one atmosphere. Um, in that case, no work is done. Even though the gas expanded, um, it didn't do any work. Um, the work done against a constant external pressure follows this equation. I think it was 3.2. So um, it's the external pressure times the change in the volume. Well, we're going to have to calculate those volumes the initial volume is going to be NRT over P1. The uh, final volume is going to be NRT over P2. Again, assuming the moles and the temperature stands uh, is the same. So the work is going to be equal to uh, minus uh, the external pressure, um, which is essentially the P2. Right, it's whatever the final pressure is times the difference is in the volume. And then I'm going to make my substitutions from above and do some factoring to get minus nRT P2 times the inverse in those pressures. So I have a bunch of substitutions to make. 0 0.850 moles is what the N value is. The gas law constant that we're most familiar with, liter atmospheres, k dot mole. Um, T is 300 K, and the final pressure is 1 atm. So that's the, that's the prefix part, and now I have the final pressure, 1 over 1 atmosphere minus 1 over 15 atms. Um, if I work that through, I get minus... 19.5 liter atmospheres. There's a conversion factor, 101.3 joules times liter atmospheres. I'm going to actually ask you to derive that. And I get a value of minus 1980 joules. 
Um, so for doing the reversible case, I'm using the equations based on 3.5, and I could just plug in some of the data that I already used. Here, I'm going to use 8.314, um, so I can go straight to joules. And I have natural log of, I have 15 over 1. The units will cancel. If I do that, I get quite a bit more energy out of my system by doing it reversibly. There's some sketches in the book that I think are useful for you to um, take a look at. So in going from, this is against the constant external pressure. Essentially what you have is the area of that rectangle if you plot pressure versus volume. So if the expansion happens all at one time, um, alternatively, if you're doing it reversibly, that can be viewed as um, the, remember, the sum under the curve of an infinitesimally large amount of tiny little steps. And so the area here is larger. So the area here by meaning in C, which is reversible, is larger than the area in B, the expansion all at one time. Okay. Um, there's another example in the book involving heat. Um, so this is an example involving heat from our text. If a 73 kilogram person drinks 500 grams of milk with a caloric value of 720 calories per gram, I'm assuming it's the little c calorie. If 17% of that potential energy from the milk can be converted into work, how tall a height can be climbed? So um, let's calculate um, the amount of energy that can be extracted from the milk. Calculate the amount of energy that can be extracted from the milk. So it's going to be 17% or the fraction 0.17 of 500 grams times the 720 little c calories per gram times if I want to put it in SI units, I can get that into joules. So what this is saying is there's 2.6 times 10 to the fifth joules available for work. Now, um, to go against gravity, the energy that needs to be expelled by the person is going to be MGH. Um, the mass we've set is a 73 kilogram person, so I'm going to convert that to grams. Um, you know what, if I'm going to keep it in joules, actually I see that I should keep it in kilograms right there. So 73 kilograms, um, acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, and the height, really the change in height, is what I don't know. So I'm going to take the 2.6 times 10 to the fifth joules that's available for work, divide by 73 kilograms, and the acceleration due to gravity, and I get a value of 360 meters. So Let's just say, based on what I've talked about so far, um, I'd like you to try some problems from the end of the chapter. So 3.3, 3.5, and 3.6 kind of flow from what I've just talked about here. Um, I'll probably post a video later in the day. Um, again, get back to me to see, for, uh, to see how this works out. Bye-bye.